Welcome to Seward Park. I'm Joey Manson of the Seward Park Audubon Center. Let's explore the park. Originally home to the Puget Sound Salish, the indigenous people who lived on Lake Washington referred to the lake as Hachu and called themselves the Lake People. In their Lashuti language, their name for the peninsula that now forms Seward Park was Skabuxt. The English translation for Skabuxt is, it has a fat nose, which is an apt and fitting name for this beautiful forested peninsula that is shaped like a fat nose. The word uh, we use for nose is buxid. And you can hear that word, you can hear part of that word in the, in the, the place name, skabuxed, buxed. So that explains, kind of, kind of gives you an idea of, of how Lushootseed, in Lushootseed, our ancestors, when they used place names, would typically use uh, uh, words that described the landform. Seward Park is really a gem in the Seattle Park system. It is a really important and robust tract of old growth forest. It's one of only two remaining old growth forests here in the city of Seattle. It's a remnant of the forest that cloaked almost all of the landscape of Seattle prior to European settlement. And it is a place where you can come and experience Old growth trees, these are the oldest living organisms in the city of Seattle. We not only value Seward Park for those textbook values that um, we, we think about when it comes to forests, like carbon sequestration or wildlife habitat. Like I think we're, we might be just like a quarter mile away from a coyote den. It is important for people's yeah, and mental health and just overall well-being that this, a, a place like this exists. When you plant a tree by itself, it grows quick, but it also dies fast. And if you plant a tree in a community of others, it grows slow, but it lives much longer. And I find that to be very true for our young people, the needs that they have. To be surrounded by a diverse community that sees them as possible, that pours into them as possible, and make sure that all their needs are met. We can learn that from Seward Park. We can learn that in a way that allows us to live it out so all of our young people and community are seen as possibilities to be developed and not problems to be solved. I also love nature. I was always into nature. I was always into bugs, just being outside with the trees. Just being out here with all the trees is just amazing and it's an amazing experience and don't ever forget it. Most of my work is very much anchored in the park. Originally, I started to be very inspired by the trees that grow there. My interest in the trees themselves and the way that the light travels across the kind of the outside rooms of the forest has now started to deepen into a deeper understanding of the mycorrhizal networks within the soil. You know, we're learning more and more that the symbiotic relationship between fungi and trees and fl flora in, on the planet um, is really essential to the health of a forest. Since gaining official park status in 1911, Seward Park has been a haven for nature, beauty, and spiritual renewal in the midst of a booming metropolis. Yet this beautiful, rare, old growth forest in the city is experiencing the impacts of human activity and climate change. Dominant plant species are dying and ecological relationships are fraying. These losses can present an opportunity. Their study, comprehension, and the possible discovery of remedies will benefit not only this park, Seattle's crown jewel, but regional forests as well. Something was wrong with the sword ferns and I could not figure it out. It was just that there was a sense that something had gone wrong. So I kept, I came back I think every day that week and finally could describe what it was that I was seeing, which was that it looked as if the, the ferns began to, had become to look like they do after a snowfall, where they're crushed. The ferns, 
were up to my waist, all the way around here. And you can see some of the survivors here and here. But for years, it was dead. This area behind me that we call ground zero, because this is where the process of fern dying started and uh, because it looks like a nuclear blast. Um, this entire area was solid with sword ferns. Behind me here, you can see nice lush sword ferns that are like pretty solid uniform sword ferns. This is what ground zero used to look like. Um, but as we just come down the trail a little bit, you can start to see that there are ferns that look pale in color, like they're losing their color, and then they turn brown. And then we get further down here where you can see lots of dead ferns and some, some stumps of old ferns. And we don't really know what makes um, one area get attacked before the other, or if they're all doomed to go or if some will survive. Uh, but uh, this is kind of what we see in places all over the park. Sword ferns and Douglas firs live a similar life, though the sword ferns are more robust, that they, they come into bare ground um, after a fire, after the, the ice left here. They, they grow in the open sun, and then they live for centuries. These uh, common um, Pacific Northwest and all the, all the way down the coast, uh, all the way up into Alaska, um, this dominant, um, quiet plant. And here they're dying. These urban forests really are on the front lines of so much stress, ecological stress brought about by uh, all of the impacts that human beings have on the world. We thought originally that the sword fern die-off phenomenon was restricted to Seward Park. Um, it turns out that whether or not it originated in Seward Park, it was first noticed here, we've been discovering it in more and more places throughout the region, including in some forests that we, and on the edges of some forests that we thought were less susceptible to these kinds of uh, issues. The more we understand here from our urban research, the more we can start mitigating uh, these kinds of issues, and in this case, the sword fern die-off, as it begins to affect more wild landscapes. You have to start with a, a hypothesis. And the hypothesis is that it is a pathogen, and in any case, the damn sword fern is dying. One of the most important opportunities they have is to pursue this question of what's causing the mortality of the sword fern. And the sword fern is a really, really important understory species throughout the Douglas fir region. And we need to know what's going on there, uh, what factors are involved, whether or not a pathogen is involved. And if there is a pathogen involved, you know, how, uh, how we need to deal with that in order to avoid having it spread. So I think that's one of the very best opportunities for, uh, to do good both for the, the, the park itself and for the region as a whole. We could see in Seward Park that the die-off appeared to be spreading through the forest, but not affecting any of the co-occurring native plant species. Uh, so this was a good indicator that the blight was in fact caused by a pathogen, um, because abiotic processes don't tend to travel through the forest in that manner. I work on uh, plant pathogens, mainly uh, root disease pathogens, and um, those phytophthoras that are waterborne. So the Seward Park situation uh, was interesting to me because it behaves just like a um, soil-borne uh, root-infecting plant pathogen, like Phytophthora. So we took samples, um, didn't find anything, which was very uh, concerning. We expected to find something there. Eutrix uh, filicum, when you read about it, at least uh, they are associated with ferns. Typically count any anywhere from, let's say, five up to uh, 28 
in half an hour. And that's what I was doing, half an hour blocks of time. And I, I had a, an idea that most, when I was counting the leaf hoppers, I would generally find more associated with areas that were being impacted by, by the, the pathogen. We decided to test a competing hypothesis that drought is actually what's causing the sore from blight. Um, so we conducted a field study in partnership with Friends of Seward Park uh, in which we compared the foliar moisture content of symptomatic and healthy sword ferns in Seward Park with the soil moisture content. Um, this is during the height of our drought season, uh, when you might expect um, effects from drought stress to be strongest. Um, so what we found was uh, there, are, there is significantly lower foliar moisture content in the symptomatic sword ferns. Um, something is causing them to wither away, but it's not for lack of soil moisture. Um, we found no significant differences in the amount of water in the soil between areas with symptomatic ferns or healthy ferns. That suggests that drought stress is not the primary cause of the sword fern blight. Paul um, provided the first preliminary evidence that um, the blight is probably caused by a pathogen in a uh, pilot study he did. What I did was I, I, I uh, plucked um, about a dozen fronds from the forest. Um, six of them were healthy, from healthy plants, still thriving. Six of them were from diseased uh, uh, plants, so they were the affected fronds. Brought them home, cleaned out six beer bottles, filled them with tap water, and I stuck different pairings of the fronds into different bottles. Half of the bottles had a healthy, healthy pair, and the other half of the bottles had a healthy paired with a, an affected frond. And I watched them over, over three weeks. I uh, photographed them along the way to keep a record. We got a result, somewhat to my surprise. We found that there was, uh, um, in the, the bottles that were a pairing of a healthy frond and a disease frond, after three weeks, the disease, the healthy frond looked pretty much like the disease frond. Meanwhile, in the healthy, healthy pairings in those bottles, the, 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 the healthy fronds had wilted a little bit, as you might expect after three weeks in a beer bottle, but um, th they were distinctly different from the, the, the affected healthy pairings. This, um, this suggested that there may be a waterborne pathogen that had moved from the affected frond um, to the healthy one. So what I'd like to see us do is uh, sample these uh, plants, maybe some fronds that are starting to show dieback symptoms and some healthy ones, and do the, uh, the next generation sequencing where we extract DNA and sequence everything in that sample and see if there's any differences between the microbiome of the healthy fronds and the diseased fronds. I think that should be our next step. As far as doing the DNA sequencing, if there was funding, we could do that in our lab. So funding is a big issue and that we need help to preserve our forests and meadows so the plants here can survive and adapt. And when they can't, we can figure out what we can do as the human species to best help them and not create more problems by interfering in a way that, for lack of research, may cause more harm than good. And it represents to me a great opportunity of, you have the habitat here in place, you've got a major educational institution with people that are involved in environmental science, you have caring and concerned citizens that live right around and right next to the park. You've got everything you need to help learn about, study, and preserve areas like Seward Park. But those need help and support, help in, in the form of grants, in the form of donations, in the form of people giving either their treasure financially or giving of their time, their effort like the volunteers that come here and work in the park. If we can get people on board with their time and treasure to help, Seward Park represents the ideal ground of habitat to help increase our knowledge, learn about what our habitat needs to thrive and survive, and then extrapolate that to all of our green areas in the Seattle regions. It's a great opportunity, and I'm excited to be a part of taking advantage of it. I just love Seward Park. It's great, close to your neighborhood. There's plenty of trails, plenty of people. 
you get to meet all types of people. Plus, I get to walk with my group of firefighters here. It's just a wonderful place to be. I love Sword Park. I call it my backyard. I come with my friends, with my family to walk throughout the year. I'd love to see the health of the forest researched. I think like one of the things I want to take away from, you know, this study is that um, of how much we have to take care of this earth and we take care of where we are and take care of um, where we are because it has so much to do with who we are. And uh, the sword fern is one of those that uh, I think has been here for so long and is so bountiful and plentiful that we kind of take it for granted. It's overlooked and is often stepped over or walked upon uh, without even uh, regarding it or acknowledging it. There's a, a message being conveyed by Mother Nature that something is wrong and out of balance. We've got to do something um, soon. And one of the biggest epiphanies I've had while on this project is that this is really necessary work and that there's not enough funding. But I think that it's important to know that if something's happening here, it's likely gonna happen in other places. No nature, no us. Nature provides clean air and therapy for everyone who comes through. So no nature, no us. We need to figure out why the ferns are dying. It's now time to move from uh, beer bottles to beakers and autoclaves. It's time to move from uh, tape measures and smartphones to uh, DNA sequencing and, and cytometry. It's important to move from enthusiastic uh, weekend uh, volunteers to professional scientists well-trained in the field and able to bring everything they know and all of their, their expertise to the problem in a sustained way until it's figured out. That means that, that we now need serious sustained funding to support that work.